it is great to have him here. I think he's a rare find, and I think he's someone we will spend a lot of time talking to, Dr. W- Wendell Wallace. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, thank you to the listening audience, uh, the viewing audience. Thank you, uh, Renny, for having me here this morning. It's a pleasure. I, I, I thank you so very much. It is 14 minutes after 11 o'clock. Dr. Wendell Wallace is my guest, and we are talking this morning about Trinidad and Tobago. As we get closer and closer into independence, we are 55 years old. Question is, can we keep, can we keep incarcerating ourselves out of the crime wave that we are experiencing, not unique to us, but we're dealing with Trinidad and Tobago. Your 2013 publication, a handbook about gangs for Caribbean parents and children, speaks to the plight of nations around the world with organized violent crimes. While being a relatively new phenomenon to the region, to the extent it is because of the macabre nature of some of the atrocities we see committed, there is an urgency of now that I think the citizenry cannot escape or no longer hold its head turned down feeling powerless the society like most chant lock them up now sociologists and criminologists like yourself say we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of this reality what is the society to do is my opening question to you doctor well in terms of crime in trinidad and tobago in terms of crime in trinidad and tobago we certainly cannot incarcerate ourselves out of crime we cannot mm-hmm. incarcerate ourselves out of crime. What we need to do is to look at a, a more broad-based and a more holistic way of dealing um, with persons who would have run afoul of the law, whether they are juveniles or adults. And there are a host of things that um, legislators, that educators can do. And, you know, we'll hopefully we'll explore some of these this mm-hmm. morning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we continue our conversation with Dr. Wendell Wallace and what we're doing. Be, we, before we get to the obstacles, the roadblocks, the alternatives, and the imperatives of this issue. Let me first ask you, why are young boys and girls drawn to the gang culture? From your research, why are they drawn to the gang culture? Well, uh, there are many pushes and pulls from a criminological perspective. You know, as you mentioned, I want to keep it simple um, to, to, to reach the audience. So some of the pulls, for example, would be the attractiveness of gangs. And unfortunately, um, research has shown that sometimes the media itself contributes to this um, by glorifying the lifestyle of some of these um, gang leaders, mm-hmm. gang leaders, etc. Um, so that's one of the the, 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 the the pull towards the gang. In terms of pushes, you have persons residing in dysfunctional communities where crime and criminality seems to be the norm, where you look at their socioeconomic status, um, you look at the, the, the family background. So there's a whole host of pushes and pulls which tend to draw persons um, into gangs. And without the necessary parental support, in some instances, um, the gang culture, the gang life, it, it, it's very much real. There's a point you made there, and there's a lot for us to, to cover. That's why you've got the hour. Yeah. But there's a point you made there, and it cannot be minimized in any way. The marginalization, the stigmatizing, mm-hmm. and the uh, almost of saying we don't care about this community because this is what's going to happen. Yes. And when we talk in terms of what is attracting young folks to this is when you glorify the lifestyles, as you said, but you put an area of no hope, mm-hmm. then you are now saying to them you're on your own. I think this is significant that we have to really look at the role of media, both electronic and print, in the demarginalization of these societies, of these communities. Um, yes, you know, Rene, that that's so true. I remember in conducting the research for that, that gang textbook, I spoke to a young lady who went by the name, the alias of T, a young lady in her 20s, and T stands for terror. That was her gang name. Mm. And, you know, she asked me if mm, I mm, ever heard... Mm. Um, my stomach growl and, and, and coming from a relatively um, <laughs> stable family, you know, I, I didn't understand what she meant. And I asked what it meant. And she basically asked me um, if I've ever been so hungry that I've heard my stomach making noises. Uh, she went on to explain that that was the situation she faced. Mm. In fact, she came from one of the dysfunctional um, communities uh, close to Port of Spain. She also indicated to me that she came out of the gang life but because of her address, she used that address in the dysfunctional community. Mm. And she said she sent out um, close to 100 um, applications, job applications. And she said 95 
out of 100 did not respond. Mm. And she said the other responses that she got would have been when she used another address, her cousin's address in Trin City. So you see the problem that some of these persons are actually facing. It, it's very much real when you, you stigmatize, you marginalize, and you push them aside. And, and you, you know, you see, you, we expect a certain type of behavior from you because you are from mm. that community. In mm -hmm. fact, I have taught many persons at the University of the West Indies and, and at UE Roy Tech who come from some of these marginalized communities, dysfunctional communities, as they're called. And all these youths, these young men and women, really need is that opportunity. And that's where the media has to take a very serious position, understanding of their contribution uh, towards making this worse. Uh, by, by, by the way they go about. I mean, sometimes people don't even belong in a community, but they are on the periphery of a community. And the next thing you know, either in ignorance or simply because of a, a lack of diligence, uh, they're going to say, this person from Lavantel, this person from so-and-so. Yeah. Guy may be living down in Port of Spain on another side of it, but, you know, that's what they do. My guest is Tobago born adjunct lecturer, criminologist, researcher, and barrister, Dr. Wendell C. Wallace. He won in 2017 the Frederick Milton uh, Thrasher uh, Award for his research in gang Activity. The award was named in honor of Frederick Milton Thrasher, uh, author of the book The Gang. Um, we are continuing our discussion as to what we do. What is wrong with the current approach we have towards dealing with gangs in this country, uh, Doctor? From my perspective and from where I sit, we tend to focus too much on legislation. Crime and gangs, they are not a strict um, legal problem. They are social problems. Mm -hmm. So that when we focus all or the majority of our energies on new pieces of legislation, new pieces of legislation, newer pieces of legislation, but then we forget that social element. Mm -hmm. We have no, 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 no social conscience, right? What happens is that we cannot legislate away crime. We simply cannot legislate away crime. What we need to do is to put more resources into that, um, that, that social element. So we need, uh, for example, homework centers, career path guidance. You know, these are some of the things, the social elements that we can work on in order to deal with the gang problem. Now, mind you, Rennie, we need the legislation. We cannot do it without the legislation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it must mm. be, you know, there must be a judicious mix of yes, both. We, and we can't have one or the other acting um, by itself. Society, unfortunately, seems to like the approach of uh, paying on the backside instead of the front side. Yes. For some reason, there are some preventative um, things that can be put in place. Um, but I think, first of all, society have to recognize that there is a social contract yes. with all segments of the of, of the society and if you don't think that there is a compact and one that has been broken with these so-called marginalized um, so-called hot spots crime areas if you don't think there is a social compact that's been broken then you're going to end up spending a lot of money on the back end because you don't see any incentive you have no incentive or recognition of the problem to spend it on the front end on the front end yes yeah um, so with that said, Renny, you know, that's a very um, interesting point. We tend to spend monies or a lot of our resources, uh, when you look at the, the budgetary allocations, um, probably over the past five to ten years, we tend to spend a lot of our um, resources at the back end, trying to fix the problem mm -hmm. after it happens. Indeed, we tend to be a very reactive society, mm -hmm. rather than placing some of the focus on the front end. And mind you, I'm not saying that we, um, we do not have a front-end activities, but I'm saying that we need to put more activities into the preventative. Yes. Right? So let us go into the schools. Mm. Let us have some parenting programs. You know, to me, this is one of the greatest problems I see in Trinidad and Tobago and, and you know, by extension, the Caribbean, uh, where we do not hold people and more so parents accountable for some of the ills of, of, of society. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm still seeing children seven and eight years old on the street at nine and ten o'clock at night. Yes, yes, unfortunately you see it. Many say that the parent um, have failed their ch children and they agreed with that. And they are saying uh, they have not gotten them well and uh, sometimes that uh, easy escape is something that can happen because society failed the parents in the first instance. <laughs> and now the parents are passing on to their children a couple of things. They're passing on to them their cynicism. They're passing on to them their reality. They're passing on to them their way of 
make it on the streets. They're passing on to them the inattention that the parent felt. So, so, so you can't close the barn door after the horse is gone in the case of the parents, but you can learn from what happened with them. Otherwise, we're going to have this cycle continuing. So while on the one hand, as you just mentioned, yes, we have to blame the parents, are we doing anything to help these parents or are we doing sufficient to help them? Some will say, look, you went to, you had a child, that's your business, but we all pay for it. Yes. Um, you see, one of the, 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 the situations um, that I used to explain um, parenting and that relationship uh, with crime and, and children, the juveniles, is that in any almost any country um, you reside in Rennie, if you are desirous of having a driver's permit, if you're desi desirous of driving a vehicle, normally you will sit a test to drive to, to, in order to have your driver's permit, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. In order to become a parent... You lay down on the bed. <laughs> exactly. There's no test. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So that, as you said, rightfully, sometimes society might have failed the parents themselves who become parents and who may pass on some of those mm -hmm. um, negative values. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I want to say quite openly from the perspective, and this is just mm -hmm. Wendell Wallace speaking, parents, if you don't police your children, then someone will police them for you. The street certainly will. You know, the first police officer I knew, and you know, I said probably the first police officer I knew um, was my mother, Mrs. Annie Sman Wallace. You could not, my siblings and I, we simply could not enter the house with not as much as a pencil, Renny, that did not belong to us. Mm -hmm. She saw it. She mm -hmm. made it her duty. So parents, you have to police your children. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they may not, um, you know, go astray in some instances. But to me, um, proper parenting is a key to dealing with some of the, criminal, the criminality that we face now. I concur with that a thousand plus percent. And I also want to go into the question of the judiciary. I want to go into the question of what we are doing right now to correct this problem. But when we speak in terms of the parent, I come back to the fact that if they are already out there, they have done the deed, they have the children, they were not equipped to be parents because, as you said, they didn't train for it. Now that they are there, there must be some reaching out done to these young parents. I mean, it, because if we trace the problem, we go back to the 5,000 plus people who fall through the cracks every year academically. Yes. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know right. we, we can go all the way there. But let's just stick with the fact that you have the child now. It behooves society, I believe, and you can tell me uh, if, 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 if you're at variance with it. I think it behooves society right now to reach out, get in touch with these people, and help them in their everyday um, interacting, and help them with their literacy rate, and help them with getting avenues, and to remove the stigma that they walk around with. Because as long as they have that frustration and that blocked avenue all the time, and trying to find, as the girl said, you ever heard your stomach growl? Well, if you hear your stomach growl, you're not really seeing further than that. Yes, certainly. certainly. So, 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 so that's why I wonder if the society is understanding its role now that they are there. I did not cause the problem. That's true. But you are here now. And if I fail to reach out to you, then I'm going to get a couple um, multiplications of you coming up later on. Yes, yeah, somewhere down the road. Um, Rene, two programs that I have seen um, work pretty well. And, you know, because I've had the, I wouldn't say the luxury, but probably the good fortune of um, studying in, in England, some of the programs that I saw that worked there, one was called a, prog a parenting program, mm -hmm. where parents for at risk, it's not a term that I like to use because all juveniles can be at risk indeed, right? But I'll use the term nevertheless, where parents of these at risk juveniles, mm. they are brought in on afternoons, maybe after work, mm. and they're given some training. Yes. You, you know, they're taught how mm. to deal with conflict, how to manage the home, how to manage monies, etc. These are some things that can yes. work. You know, teach them mediation skills, etc. Another program um, which was legislated for in the in, in England is something called an ASBO or an antisocial behavioral order. Mm -hmm. Now, as it says, it's an antisocial, but there's another element to it called a CRASBO, which is a criminal antisocial behavioral order. So one is simply an antisocial and the other one, if you breach the antisocial, then you go into the realm of the criminal antisocial behavior. Got you. Now, what the ASBO does is that it's an avenue for both parents and children to work on their deficiencies. 
So the court orders that particular mm-hmm. child or children to keep away from particular um, locations, to be at home at particular mm-hmm. time, to be at school at a particular time. But it also places some responsibility on the parent to ensure that the child is inside, that they're doing the homework, etc. So these are just two of the programs that I have seen that mm-hmm. you know we can adapt because we tend to bring programs whole scale um, from overseas and not adapt them to our realities. So these are just two that I can think of off the top of my head. Dr. Wendell Wallace, you mentioned uh, he spent some time in London. That's at the University of London, Northumbria University, um, where you got your diploma in law. Yes. Oh, good. Good enough. Let's continue our conversation here. What role does the feeling, what role, if any, mm-hmm. Because I'm trying to understand, as a criminologist, I'm trying to extract from you what is all, all the components in the mind of these young people, why they find this glamorous, and or uh, think that uh, this is the only avenue to them. What role, if any, does the feeling that white-collar criminals getting away with high crimes play in the psyche of young people being recruited into crime? In other words, I'm seeing all these people doing it over there, and they're getting away with it. What are you telling me about following yeah. the straight and narrow? Yeah, you know, that- does that play a role? Yes, yes, it does. It certainly it does. Um, indeed, Rennie, that situation that you've just explained, it's something that's very real. You know, without getting political or even trying to sound political, I remember some years ago, there's a particular instance mm-hmm. where um, someone would have gotten a degree from Arthur Lock Jack under dubious circumstances. I'm saying I, I don't want to sound political, but mm-hmm. I'm just using it as an example. Mm-hmm. And you know, my students at the university, they, they came to me and they said, Dr. Wallace, this is what we're telling you about. You are uh, imploring us to work hard and achieve and look what's going on. Mm-hmm. The people we look up to, they are getting away with doing anything. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, to put that in the context of crime and white collar crime, White collar crime can affect a country as much as and even more than street crime. It can. You look at the amount of monies that these white collar criminals who are sometimes looked upon as role models in society. Mm-hmm. And indeed, people in dysfunctional communities, people in the so-called hotspots, and even in other communities, they look at this and say, mm-hmm. okay. So they, these individuals are in a position where they have, they have the resources. They can go to the banks and without the necessary documentation, they can receive easy access to funding. Mm-hmm. We don't. When we go to the bank, they ask us a million and one questions and then ask some more. And they are getting away with white collar crime. What should we do? In other words, the role models are committing white collar crime. <laughs> they are getting away. So they tend to justify. You and I may not justify that sort of behavior, mm-hmm. but that's what that's their reality. Mm-hmm. So they tend to justify their actions by looking at the actions of others. I think to be oblivious of that um, uh, of that um, re- contributing factor is to uh, want to live with your head in the yes. sand, yes. really. Because at the end of the day, if you ask me to follow the rules of the game. But I see the empires are finding ways around it. I'm not too sure I want to bowl um, strictly to the wicket. To the, yes, yes. Uh, it is 23 minutes after, I made that 33 minutes after 11. Uh, my guest is Dr. Wendell Wallace. And as I mentioned before, that he is also the, um, the 2017 Frederick Milton Thrasher Award winner. The award uh, that he won acknowledges scholarly works on public safety issues done by individual groups and organizations. We are talking this morning of how do we deal with ourselves going into age 55 as a nation and the crime that we are looking at. Society seems to be obsessed with vengeance, doctor, more vengeance than justice. How does one dissuade people from revenge to uh, uh, an imprisonment instead to rehabilitation? Because these folks, after they have fallen into justice system, they have to come back to the community. If a man is not armed with an alternative, and then he is stigmatized, and then he is going into a marginalized society, a community, and he cannot get a job, but he learns some extra skills in prison, hello. <laughs> um, yes, you know, society needs to understand that there is a thin line between vengeance and justice, or mm-hmm. revenge and justice. When we think vengeance, 
we are thinking about hmm. satisfying the needs of the of the person who had been wronged or yes. the victim. And when we think about justice, we are speaking about a concept which looks at returning some semblance of order maintenance to society based on rules and regulations that someone would have reached. But there's a very thin line in that. And the thin line revolves mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. rehabilitation. Yes. You know, we cannot incarcerate ourselves or, or we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of crime. That is a virtual impossibility. You know, just to quote Wendy Singh, um, you know, she said that um, mm. prisons are, are universities of crime. Prisons can mm -hmm. be seen as universities of crime mm -hmm. because some people may enter um, mm. and if they're not rehabilitated, they return to us and they return in, in a manner with hurt, anger, yes. vengeance. So, you know, mm. I have n not always been um, a proponent of um, rehabilitation, right? You know, until I started my research, until I started my academic journey into um, criminology and criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had a particular, uh, particularly moving instance with a young man who was sent to YTC. And, you know, his mother asked me to visit. And, you know, I started visiting him more than she did. And, you know, I saw the change in that young man's life. Rene, I do believe that we can rehabilitate people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to successfully rehabilitate 100%. But there's a substantial amount of individuals who can be reformed and who can be rehabilitated if we have the proper systems in place. And if society itself is mm. willing to accept these people um, when they are attempting to return into society. We cannot have the incorrigibles discourage us yes. from, in fact, finding what, we, what a society has to do. Um, what, what is amazing to me is that authorities uh, hear and speak, give lip service to the concept of rehabilitation. But in spite of all the evidence that's there, in spite of all you have said, Instead, uh, in, in spite of what all the proponents of rehabilitations have said, for some reason, those who govern are not listening. Why is that? <laughs> um, should I sound cynical? Should I sound real? Uh, well, sometimes <laughs> it's hard to, 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 to tell the line between both, but <laughs> cynicism <laughs> and reality. <laughs> but say it as it is. You know, there, there's, Rene, there's a saying mm -hmm. um, that politicians tend to listen to themselves the most, right? I'm not knocking any um, politician, mind you, if you're there and you're listening, I'm not knocking any politician, but it's a global saying yes, sir. that some of the best research that you can find in every country in the world that has to deal with social programs and social activism, they lie in the libraries. They lie in the libraries and, you know, the legislators, the decision makers, even when you send those um, theses, et cetera, to them, they pay them lip service. Mm, so mm. there needs to be a closer collaboration between researchers and um, policymakers in order to implement some of these global best practices. As a criminologist yourself, I want to take you into the area of remand. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, a remandy, quote unquote, if there's no such word, I just coined it. Okay. The re remandy, the man in remand, the person in remand, they get in there, they are waiting trial, yes. so which means they're innocent. Yes. It takes them a number of years in there, they have lost productive time because in Trinidad and Tobago it can go up to 10 years. And, and we talk about recruiting criminals and tooling folks to come out here and do crime. When they come out, because they spend time in remand, Trinidad and Tobago is not exactly uh, a big country, so everybody's got to find out where you've been. Yes. Mm -hmm. One way or the other. So he has no opportunity. Now, he was found uh, uh, innocent, and or his case was dismissed, but he already spent four years inside of there learning the ways of survival in there, mm -hmm. learning the ways of survival not just in there but on the streets when you go back out, yes. and now he's back out. And uh, uh, he is faced with just no opportunity to 
to, to work, to make a living. What else is he supposed to do? Why I am raising this is because we are, I'm trying to bring clear to everybody the need for what we all know, which is a speedy trial for a man is real justice, uh, and justice delayed is justice denied indeed. Yes. But, but that's one reality. But it has to take a, 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 a ground swell of everybody recognizing that we are in fact recruiting crimin criminals by keeping them in remand for this period of time. Uh, am I off base on this? No, you, we, we're very much on the same playing field here, Armani. One of my pet peeves with the whole criminal justice system revolves around the whole remand system. Now, we cannot escape the fact that we need a remand system, right? Because remand is there for those... Remand is meant to be a short-term measure. But when you have persons spending 8, 10, and 12 mm. years on remand, remember on remand you're innocent, and on remand, there are no rehabilitative programs geared to the remandees. <laughs> now, when you're convicted, you have a host of programs, um, agricultural, um, musical, um, tech voc. You have a whole host of rehabilitation programs in Trinidad and Tobago and in the wider Caribbean that's placed there to, to, to retool and try to give these... Um, inmates some sort of life skill for their return, the eventual return to society. But when you are on remand, you are innocent. And remand can be, you can be on remand for two days, one month, etc. So it's very difficult to put a system in place to educate remandees. But I've always advocated that we can put uh, two weeks programs, some short programs. You, you know, you mentioned this morning that you had the adult literacy um, people here this morning. You can put one week programs in place mm -hmm. to deal with some of these remandies because if we don't, mm -hmm. and which we're not doing, it simply means that according to Wendy Singh, prison mm -hmm. or remand will now become a university of crime. Mm -hmm. What will happen, Renny, if you're there? If you're confined, you're remanded, and you have nothing else to do, you'll sit and chat with your other remandees, you might remand bodies, and you will learn the ways of the street exactly. and the ways of criminality. Yep. Simple. It's a, a very bad thing. I always uh, equally felt, which, uh, of course, no one wants to hear this, but I always felt that um, uh, a, a, a remand person uh, held unduly should have the right to sue the state for wrongful address, uh, wrongful uh, imprisonment. I mean, you know, at some point there has to be a cutoff point where a man, if he is innocent, he must be given X amount of time to go before a judge or you give him bail. Which brings me to the question of bail and alternative sentencing. Right. Uh, firstly, I feel that the whole question, and, and I think this has been recently um, uh, rectified, this question of um, surety bail mm -hmm. is something that really discriminates against a lot of people who don't have property or know anybody with access to property, so it's not going to happen. So this cash bail thing, of course, is the option to have. But let's go into the area of alternative sentencing. Mm -hmm. After we have gone past the remand, let us say you get a chance, of course, you can only go into the general population if you have gone through um, a judge and the system and you are found guilty and you're now a prisoner. Yes. Um, are we looking at alternative sentencing in a meaningful way here or are we just locked into the knee-jerk reaction of throw them in jail and, and throw away the key? Um, you know, I believe that the magistrates and judges in Trinidad and Tobago, that they are coming around to the use of alternative sentencing. And I say that um, because I'm a barrister and, and although I'm not at court as much as mm. other persons uh, because you know my primary job is that of a criminologist lecturer. Mm -hmm. But I've seen instances where mm. magistrates and judges that they're using alternative sentencing. However, there is still a preponderance of usage of incarceration as the main tool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I was telling one of my colleagues this morning, we tend, we can criminalize some social um, activity. So, for example, Renny, someone um, in local parlance is before the court for maintenance. We call a commitment warrant. That's not a crime. It is not a crime. Mm. You didn't pay the money. A warrant was issued for you and you are now placed in mm. prison. Right? But... It's not, you did not commit a criminal offense. Mm. Can we look at other ways of solving that problem? You, rene yes, you reneged on a commitment. Yes. That's what it was. It is not really a crime. crime. I got you. Mm -hmm. So we can use alternative sentencing. In Trinidad and Tobago, for example, I think one of the most underutilized um, options 
is community service. We do have what is known as the Community Service Orders Act in Trinidad and Tobago, whereby persons over the age of 16 years, with their consent, a magistrate or judge can give them a minimum of 40 and up to a maximum of 240 hours of community service. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one. That's one alternative. We can make greater use usage of fines, and we have probation. We have suspended mm -hmm. sentence, and suspended sentence to me it works wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, with a suspended sentence, um, uh, John Brown has a suspended sentence, and you know that sentence more or less is hanging over mm -hmm. your head to be on good behavior for yes. the next five years. Yes. They tend to be on good behavior. Checks and balances in place because you usually have to report to the police station. Yes. Uh, in other jurisdiction, call a parole officer. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, <go laughs> right. Ahead. So you you report to the police station and they see that you are in fact um, doing what you're supposed to do. There's another question also that John Brown, as you mentioned before, <laughs> spent some time in prison and he's outside and he cannot get a job because of mm -hmm. he has a record. If the crime is nonviolent, mm -hmm. if, 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 if the, um, the charge, you know, nonviolent uh, uh, felony, should after a number of years of good behavior, John Brown's record be expunged? Is that something that should be looked at if it's a minor, if it's a minor offense? Well, you know, just, just let me take one second before I answer that question uh -huh. because it's a really interesting question, you know. I just want to go back to mm -hmm. the alternative sentencing. Please. To you know, educate the public that, you know, there's a study that was done in England um, somewhere around 2006, 2007, where graffiti was a huge problem, right? On trains, under the walls, etc. Mm -hmm. And the court, or the, the judicial system decided that instead of criminalizing graffiti, mm -hmm. because graffiti is now moving, and, and in fact, graffiti mm -hmm. is now seen as an art. Yes. A huge contest around the world known as graffiti art. Yes. So instead of criminalizing these acts, let us sentence these persons, these graffiti artists, to remove them. Because in fact, they would be on train stations, on the trains and public buildings. Mm -hmm. And it saved the U.S. 11.5 or 11.6 um, million pounds. So I just wanted to, to, mm -hmm. to put that mm -hmm. out there, that mm -hmm. alternative sentence in can work. Now remember, when you put that individual, or when you incarcerate that individual, the state now has the responsibility to clothe, feed, and secure the individual. So mm -hmm. you're looking at the course of incarceration um, against the course of having these persons um, use community service. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I said, I just wanted to put that out there. No, alternative sentences is definitely something that has to be looked at because you keep locking people up all the time. As you said, we're going to pay for that. Yes. In addition to you bringing out some people that are very angry because some of these crimes are... <laughs> not uh, necessarily uh, very Not necessarily bad. ones that you should be in prison for. They're nonviolent uh, uh, crimes. Uh, even, e even smoking of a joint. Um, not for a moment uh, proposing that folks go about doing it or the whole legalization question is not the purpose of this discussion okay. <laughs> here. But something as minor as that, we can find some way to to, to have you follow the norms of society, society yeah. without without yeah. locking you up. Certainly. The question of you're out here, yes. you're trying to get a job, you have dealt, you made a mistake. And four years after, you followed the straight and narrow, you've had nothing against you, um, and it's a minor nonviolent offense. Should we think in terms of those records being expunged? Yes. Um, it's something that I totally agree with you there. Um, in some jurisdictions, you can have your records expunged. And in some instances, you can have your records sealed. Uh, there's a difference between both. But uh, speaking in context of expunging records, in Trinidad and Tobago, we do not... The, the process is very tedious. Mm -hmm. You can apply for presidential pardon. Right, and uh, in order to have those records um, expunged, but it's a long, arduous mm. process. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other jurisdictions, it mm -hmm. is much easier. You've spent, um, you you've been, you committed an offense. 10, 15 years would have gone by. Mm -hmm. You're in good behavior. You're morally upright citizen now. Um, should you really have this hanging over your head, right? And in other jurisdictions. It is very simple. You go to the court, you make a simple application. Uh, the magistrate or judge will look at um, the circumstances of the conviction, nature of the offense, whether you pleaded guilty or not, whether you waited the court's time, what you have done since um, your um, sentence, your initial sentence. And it's a very simple process. Mm -hmm. 
here uh you have to go you have to apply to the president apply with about seven different um forms um the the, the mercy committee they will sit and look at it uh it, in my mind it needs to be simplified mm -hmm. there is a, a sort of system here but indeed, we need to make it simple so that the, the average layman can access that. It makes no sense um, to have that hanging over your head after 20 years. Criminologist and lecturer at the University of the West Indies. He's also a barrister. Dr. Wendell Wallace is my guest here on Brunch this morning, 10 minutes away from the top of the hour. I want to go into this area of hot spots. Because in your publication of two, 2014, you addressed this question of hot spot, uh, or hot spot policing uh, and the social impact on the hearts and minds of the community. Yes. Talk about a hot spot. When a hot spot is declared by the police, it means because it has a, a statistically, the uh, violence uh, has reached X threshold. But what does it do to a community? What does it do to the occupants? How do you feel about this, this thing of labeling an area a hot spot area? There are two schools of thought on the, you know, the whole idea of hotspots and hotspot policing. So some, one school of thought is that you only label an area a hotspot because of the increased criminality and criminal activities within that particular um, community. Another school of thought says if you were to label um, the community as a hotspot, there is something known as the labeling theory where people basically self-actualize. In other <laughs> words, if you call me a criminal and um, say that I'm living in a um, hotspot, then I tend to, I may tend to behave in such a manner. Mm -hmm. Because mind you, there are numerous, there are many good, decent, honorable citizens living in these uh, hotspot communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the government or uh, the institution of government labels the area as a hotspot you label them as a hotspot you label them as delinquent um prospective uh workplaces label them as as hotspots and as delinquents so they tend to self-actualize yes right um for me as a criminologist i understand the terminology i understand why um they would be labeled as hotspots um, but it's not something that I am very much, um, uh, very much in tune with. It's something mm -hmm. that I, I tend to refrain from labeling communities as being hotspots. This is consistent with exactly what we said about the media uh, stigmatizing yes. the an area. I mean, there are some wonderful people who live who who, who live in um, Endeavor. Yes. There are wonderful people who live in Enterprise, yes. and uh, the minute you call it. Uh, people already made the association. Some wonderful people live in Lavento. Yeah. And if you call it, and while there are some horrible people who live in some wonderful areas. <laughs> exactly. <but laughs> we don't label them. <laughs> it is not labeled at all. Um, the, the, the question of the priorities for the nation, because we are going into 55. We, not unlike or many other Caribbean neighbors, have a situation where the economies are under strain which means you're going to have people finding more and more means, even though um, our history here kind of contradicts that because we had a whole lot of money and the crime kept going up. But anyway, um, as times become harder, people are more inclined to find alternative ways. The underground economy surfaces, let's yes. put it for what it is. So we're going to have this problem for a very long time. The three primary areas you, as a criminologist, see uh, that we have been three primary areas where we've been dealing with this the wrong way and some suggestions as to how the nation at 55 can go about not attempting to incarcerate itself out of our plight. Well, in terms of what we should do as a nation, um, you know, I am saying that we should start with um, parental responsibility. I think we need to go back to the basic mm -hmm. institution of the home where we teach our children the basic virtues and the basic values of love, respect, honor, honesty. You know, in a time gone by, it was the village that raised the child. You know, I can say safely that I'm a product of my village, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to go back to a sort of, um, I'm not advocating communal living, but certainly restoring that pride within families, within communities, that would be my number one priority, getting parents to understand their role um, in society. 
The second area that I would focus on is education. We need an education system that caters for all the groups. Mm -hmm. Because our education system tends to focus quite a lot on academic achievement. Mm -hmm. And we have a host of persons who may not be so academically inclined. And they fall through the cracks. You know, I've seen some even reach the university level, some dysfunctional um, <laughs> or, 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 or dysfunctional um, academics. I heard somebody use a term one time that I actually like. They said that we've become such a paper society mm -hmm. that when we get a strike of a match called reality, everything burns up. Yeah. You know, so I, I would say that we need to ensure that our education system is um, a bit more updated. And the third area that I would look at in terms of um, this whole incarceration, what can we do to assist you know, I would certainly say that the policymakers need to take a different approach. So let us move away from a strict legalistic approach. Let us try to put more social, um, more resources into social, uh, you know, social conditioning. Mm -hmm. Let us ensure that, you know, some of the simple things are in place. For example, you construct these high-rise buildings and you have no play facilities, etc. <laughs> that is... Mm -mm. A recipe for disaster. It's a tenement yard. Yeah. You're warehousing people. people. You warehouse people, you're going to get the product of that. Oh. And if you want to understand what the product of that is, put crabs in a barrel. Eventually, they start eating themselves. Steps, yeah. You know, before um, we end, Rene, I'd like to make a plea for, you know, academics, for legislators, for decision mm -hmm. makers, for us to all stop working in silos. Let us come off the ivory towers and let's work together to solve um, the problem of crime. Because too often, you find that the Ministry of National Security is working one way, mm -hmm. then you have the, um, the university working one way, um, social development working in the other way, when we can indeed, when we can come together and work. Because as I said, crime is a social problem. And society has to stop, um, the, you know, citizens have to stop looking at this as a us and them the, situation. Because as, as as much as we want to think there, uh, there, there is us and them, believe me, if we don't correct this now, them will keep multiplying. And very soon we'll find out that there is no room for us, for us yeah. to speak to us. And you know, another important mm -hmm. area, Armani, is that we need for society to understand that, you know, this we, them, or us, them situation, that it affects all of us and mm -hmm. it will affect all of us eventually. So that if we want to leave a Trinidad and Tobago that mm -hmm. is safe, then we must take that responsibility. We cannot simply blame um, the police or blame the legislators. I'm certainly not for one moment suggesting that, you know, in my previous uh, discussion. We need the, the entire body. Yes, we need the legislators, the educators to do their bit. But society must also take responsibility mm -hmm. because in... In quite a few instances, Rene, and, and I'm not speaking um, from hearsay or anecdotal evidence, it's a fact that in most instances, in some instances, it's the society that harbors and hides some of the criminal element. So we as a society need to take some responsibility as well, Rene. You're from Tobago, <laughs> uh, proudly so, and yes, as such, yes. you know exactly what it, w w what it means when you hear the state, but it takes a village to raise a child. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, uh, it's the entire world via the internet raising our children now, so unless something is done to have us coexist, um, have us live together, as against just coexist, <laughs> because you can't coexist and not know who's next to you. <laughs> exactly. But you need to know who's next to you, because just by knowing uh, Dr. Wallace across the street means that my child now has four eyes looking at him, at least so he feels. Yes. And by me knowing uh, Mr. Wallace across the street and uh, Miss Yatali across yes. there, it now we, we have six. Six, yes. And children are aware when their eyes watching them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the failure to, to, to live as a community is only contributing to making the situation worse than what we're looking at right now. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Renny. Mm. You know, I grew up in a village in Tobago, Castara. I don't know if you've mm, ever been I there know yet. Castara, yes. <laughs> right. And you know, there were persons, there were mm. so many persons who I can think of. You know, they're Mr. Crooks and Teacher Fidelia and Mr. Fraser and Mr. Jackson. You know, while I'm on the street heading home mm. from school, 
if I stop to play or to stray, of course, they would ensure that I'm on the street and narrow path heading home. So, yep. you know, you're quite correct that it, it's an all-embracing and all-inclusive effort, you know, to deal with the situation that we're facing now in Trinidad. And Folks who are interested in more of your work, your book and so on, how they, can they access these things? Um, well, in order to access the book, you can contact me at 710-4688. That's 710-4688. Or you can um, simply email me at the University of the West Indies. Uh, my email address is wendell.wallace at sta dot uwi.edu and I'm sitting Renny would um, ensure that you have it. Yeah, we have that already and uh, when, when, the, when the interview goes up there, folks can double and, and triple check on it yes. and uh, I'll make some, some uh, other, use some other means to get it out there as well. Dr. Wendell Wallace, criminologist, thank you so much for taking the time to be in with us this morning. We will, again, as I said um, with the minister, these are areas that we, we, we confront every day so again, I'm happy to have you as a resource. We'll be reaching out to you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to be in this morning. Thank you for having me, Renny. It's a pleasure. The pleasure was mine indeed.